Thank you for coming out on this beautiful, warm night. I think it's probably going to snow on Saturday, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the modern world. All right. I'm going to open with this song. Signal Culture Residency in um, last fall. So you're getting to see this for the first time. Mm -hmm. Rain, are you a witch? G yelled, slapping the steering wheel. I writhed, silent. I knew it, you're a witch. I just stared out the windshield. We had to get to rehearsal. G was a bit much for me. There's this kind of physical privilege that some people possess where they can be free with their bodies to do whatever, and that includes their mouths. <laughs> G was responsible for maybe the most humiliating thing that's ever happened to me. But that hadn't happened yet. We were still on our way to rehearsal. When you don't have a driving license, you make a lot of concessions. You have to put up with the driver's ideas, whatever they are. You have to listen to their music and smell their smells and trust that they know what they're doing behind the wheel. I wish I remember what I said that tipped my hand. It wasn't, I wasn't out about my witchcraft. I was barely even out to myself. I've said this before and I'll say it again. It was easier for me to come out as a transsexual lesbian than it was for me to come out as a witch. I mumbled some half-assed thing to G to get her to drop the subject. My ploy worked. Soon she was talking about another one of her interests instead, and I was happy to hear it. My time had not yet come. I still had to get through rehearsal, and then the show, and maybe some time after that, I would allow myself to come out into the light just a little bit more. We're 
We're in this moment in which it seems like witchcraft as an idea has never been so popular. And of course, you know, the more the merry meteor. I've been through enough generations of temporary radicals to develop a certain skepticism of vagaries. But you know what's different about this current moment? There's a lot of us who have been waiting a long, long time to come out, and now we are. And this reminds me a lot of the time when I was wandering around looking for someone, anyone, like me at all. And it wasn't until the internet became a thing for me that I began to find trans people that I could communicate with. I had discovered I was trans years before the internet shined its light on me. I discovered that I was a witch in childhood as well. I didn't really have words for those things at the time, but I knew. And I knew the words by the time I was able to walk to school on my own. I've always been a walker, you know. It's my most long-held earth practice. I cannot stress how funny it is to me that it took longer for me to come to terms with being a witch than any of the other challenges, even though I can pinpoint an awareness of this in me as early as third grade. I learned the names of the goddesses. They began to reach me. Thus began my night journeys, and I began to look at the stars. And then the moon found me. The feminine divine would manifest in many ways in the ensuing years, usually without subtlety. For years, I would find myself emotionally devastated by roadkill every single time I passed a fresh corpse on the way to somewhere else. Denying, filtering my witch nature has been the most hurtful thing I've ever done for myself. I tried to mask it with atheism and through the can't beat him, join him kinds of Christianity and Buddhism. And it took me a long time to find witches I trust. I found some, and then it turns out there are a lot more of us than I imagined. The first time I met John Waters in person was the night before my familiar died. He had just released his Christmas album, and my old friend and confidant Denise bought me a copy and took me to the signing at Sound Garden in Baltimore. We stood in a long line, braving the wintry winds blasting off the harbor. I had no idea that my familiar was going to die the next morning. I knew she was nearing her last days, but it wasn't clear when. Denise and I stood in that long line. She's a lawyer and a mom of an amazing young person now, and in those days she was just one of those risk-taking college friends I could trade Foucault puns with. <laughs> Finally, we got to the table, and I met John, and he signed my CD. He smiled and asked me my name. He signed and asked me if my parents were hippies. I didn't really hear him, so I asked him to repeat the question, which he did. He said, your name's Rain. Were your parents hippies? And I said, I got goofy and bashful. And I said, oh no, more like hippie me. We walked away, and suddenly I felt such shame. I can't believe I told John Waters I was a hippie, I said, suddenly feeling like I had never left junior high in spite of being a 30-something Gen Xer. Speaking of which, you may have no idea how popular 30-something was at my college. Like a whole dorm would get together and watch it. What the fuck? It was nuts. <laughs> Early the next morning, my first familiar, Colette, my cat of 13 of her 18 years, died in my arms. And it took me nearly 15 years for my esprit d'escalier to arrive. What I should have said to John Waters that night about the origin of my name was, more like which me. Coming to terms with my epistemology, or maybe you'd call it my spirituality, my religion, my faith, has been immensely liberating. I don't want to convince anyone to think that I do, think like I do. I'm convinced that it's impossible to do so. You either understand me or you don't. You either allow my place in this world or you don't. What we are witnessing now is that many of us who have been working with similar epistemologies are connecting in ways we never have before. This means we are more powerful than we have ever been. What's more is that even if we are collectively hurrying onwards to some exciting knowledge whose attainment is destruction, even if something happens to make it so that our fragile networks are never restored and we are permanently losing touch with loved ones due to distance and disease, there will always be witches. We will always float among you. We were born as well as made. And if I had had the strength of knowledge when I was writing with G, I might have been able to meet her on her own terms and talk freely. Instead, I felt shame and fear, and we discussed something else. She may have rubbed me the wrong way with her enthusiasm, but this was an overall loss for me because it added to my delay. And from where I sit now, it all seems so clear. This is why I love the feeling of my barefoot on earth. The spiritual calling was coming from outside the house I grew up in. 
my motion through the world has been inevitably caused, or has inevitably caused harm, and that feeling was devastating. But now, we have arrived, we are awake, and we are aware. Now what are we to do? And this brings me to Paulina Peavy. Yes, I'm a witch, and I recognize Paulina's work as wading into witchy waters. <laughs> she may recoil from the assignation, she may embrace it, she may abhor it. But the witch in me recognizes the witch in her. Now, I think it's no surprise that I would be drawn to Paulina's work. I knew nothing of her before Sarah invited me to witness her work and respond. <laughs> um, and I was immediately sold. Um, especially upon discovering her function as an oracle for Lacamo, for her devotion to the notion that our binary sex system was at the root of our troubles, for the bold way she approached her life and her art. This was a woman who decided to take up making films on film when she was nearly 80. Brilliant. <laughs> and while all of these things were amazing and noteworthy, and let's hope that more and more of her archive becomes uncovered and her name is known so that maybe next time we convene over her corpus that perhaps I will be free to address each of these other points more fully. But what I want to talk about now is her destruction. She destroyed her work deliberately. I understand this. I have destroyed more work than I've kept, and I've kept a lot. At my first viewing of this exhibit, the pieces that struck me the most were her smoke drawings over here. These simple, ghostly shapes stood in certain contrast to the bold and colorful works surrounding them. I think about these pieces as the reminders that she burned so much. These pieces on the wall she spared. She didn't burn them, but she thought about it. <laughs> she probably thought about burning every piece in this room, but why? Surely not because she doubted what she knew to be real. Why are these the things that survived? Is Lacamo satisfied? I tried to summon Lacamo several times. I don't work well with masks. My glasses get in the way of masks. <laughs> in a way, I argued my glasses are sort of like a mask. I put on my most ornate pair, the ones that always make me a little dizzy at first. <laughs> I sang, I chanted, began to suspect that this Lacamo had nothing to say to me. My calls to Lacamo were friend requests to someone who had long ago hit their 5,000 number ceiling. <laughs> How long do you call someone who never picks up and who never returns your messages? How long do you wait for someone with no plans to arrive? You never know who will be able to move you, to speak through you. Coming to understand that you have become an oracle is a strange thing. Coming to understand your limits is even stranger. To date, to my knowledge, Lacamo has had nothing to say to me. And I don't take it personally. I'm not sure how much I've got to say to Lacamo either. Because sure, yes. Lacamo delivered some gospel around the way that a sex gender binary has been foundationally problematic for all of human history. But why? Sorry, Lacamo. Why do I get the feeling that Lacamo didn't always quite practice what he preached? But because I'm me, and because I'm a woman, and I'm a radically feminist one at that, I'm interested in talking to Polina anyway. Because she lived for the full duration of the 20th century. Because she made bold moves and bold work. What made her choose to listen to her muse and to name him? Did she feel she did the job she was here to do? What on these walls would she have tossed if she had had just one more dump run? What else do we need to know? I'm excited to see what happens in the coming years, to see how much more of her archive emerges. Her biography is still so full of gaps. What else will we learn? What else do we need to know? I have a feeling that one way or another, we're going to find out. And so, Paulina, thank you for your vision. May more of us learn to see. With much admiration, your new biggest fan. Um, in my songwriting, I uh, 
typically don't uh, open myself to other voices, but um, some years ago I started, uh, okay, so I got this idea that um, because there are these bands like uh, Led Zeppelin who would read Lord of the Rings and write songs about it or whatever, <laughs> that I thought, well, since I'm reading a lot of critical theory, maybe I should write songs based on the works of, you know, Chris Deva or, uh, <laughs> you know, to see what, see what, what uh, Foucault has to say in, in a song. Um, uh, but the song that uh, really seems to be um, important for me to sing tonight is a song that I wrote um, when I was uh, reading through Also Sprach the Zarathustra many, many, many years ago. And, uh, so here's a song based off of one of those passages uh, that's called At Noon. Projection and your 
choice to stand in front of it and project it into the open space instead of onto a screen. And, um, you know, I see all of these connections between that and Paulina's work. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice fit. I'm wondering if you made the projection with the intention of using it as such or whether it's I, I did it specifically, but, um, you know, because my residency was in, um, like, October, November, so just on the cusp of, like, even, I don't even think I had booked the gig, frankly, at that point. Maybe I had. I can't remember for sure, but, um, you know, I've just gone up to, to work on several things, some things that are narrative and, like, very, like, very ordinary, but then, you know, this, Signal Culture, if you don't know, is this amazing experimental video uh, residency that's in upstate New York in Owego. And, um, you know, they've got all these really cool tools to like, just like, make your video do wacky things, you know? So it's not really a narrative kind of a place. It's an experimental video sort of a place. And, um, you know, I get overwhelmed by technology, you know, but like it had all these gadgets and I'm just like, let me just try some things. And I brought like several of my Tarot decks and um, what was really awesome is in the room, uh, that they had, all uh, well, the equipment in it, had one of these very old um, uh, fireplaces, these mantelpieces, and it had this uh, kind of brass facial sculpture embedded in it, right? And, um, you know, and so I had set up a little altar up there um, to just, you know, kind of like watch over all the stuff that I was working on, all the gadgetry and stuff, because I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with all these wires and things, but hopefully this all, like, this energy will help fuel it. And, um, you know, over the week that I was there, I just started pointing cameras at it and started, you know, kind of making things happen. And so this was a result of, uh, you know, part of the result of some of that work that I was doing. Um, and uh, so that just kind of, kind of came organically based on, like, what I was, you know, Playing, playing around with, and um, uh, these, this specific chunk was really focused on uh, two of the tarot cards that have been really um, kind of like the ground, <laughs> this is a funny thing to say, but like kind of the ground from which I've been operating for the last couple of years, and um, I don't know if you know much about the uh, use of, of tarot at all, but um, I, I've been drawing both Temperance and the Tower a lot, <laughs> and so uh, these are uh, Temperance being a card which is effectively about patience and like just you know taking care of business and just like keeping things going. Um, and then the Tower is like everything is falling apart and things are burning and you know it's uh, pretty much uh, really the, the what seems to be going on in our country right now too. So you know. Um, like patience, everything's falling apart. Patience, everything's falling apart. And so this particular piece that um, I presented here was the stuff that was we're looking around uh, those themes. So I had several decks, and I pulled all the temperance cards and all the tower cards. And um, you know, as I was thinking about uh, how I wanted to uh, bring this whole thing together, uh, it was really this projection that anchored everything. You know, it was the underpinning of the essay that I wrote and uh, that I began to write and um, really helped fuel the choices of the songs that I selected. So I opened with um, Marianne Faithful's Witches Song. It was kind of an inv invocation and I used my weird uh, also Sprockler Arthustra song to, to close out. Um, but like it was all, all wrapped around like thinking about how uh, patience and like uh, you know the, the kind of the situation that we find ourselves in where like structures seem to be falling away beyond our power. Um, and uh, I don't know, once, once I kind of like realized like that was a piece that I had made that I could put over this, it really, it really I mean it was like it was the rug that tied the room together in so many ways I thought. Um, and, uh, you know, and I thought, you know, just kind of talking about, like, how to use the space, I thought maybe it's a little bit hubristic just to kind of project over work that's here, but, like, I felt like a real merger, you know, like, there was, like, I felt a very personal connection the very first time I came through this space and thought, like, you know, we want to, we want to, like, bring some dialogue together between the work that I'm doing and the work that she's doing. Um, you know, and it's not lost on me that there's a lot of, like, embedded faces in a lot of her work as well, which, you know, my projection really relies on as well. 
Um, so I know it was kind of a bold move on my part, but I hope Paulina appreciates like a bold move. <laughs> it seems like she might. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask you, Rain? Yes. Uh, I was struck by in the Marianne Papal song the line, "Danger is or brings great joy." Danger is great Danger joy. Danger is great joy. Yeah. So. The, the quick background to that is when Billy came to me months ago, he said, so I've got this idea of bringing this artist into the gallery who talks to UFOs and does really strange stuff. That right. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet now that it's here, it's of course brought great joy. Not only the creative response tonight, we have another one been a big feature story in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. uh, learning about her as an individual and her trials and tribulations has been incredibly uplifting and edifying to all of us that have been a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you'd comment on that line, danger is great joy. Well, I'm going to just uh, you know, go into that saying, like, uh, coming into this beautiful space and, uh, you know, into a, an environment that is unfamiliar to me was like a huge uh, nerve-wracking challenge, you know? Um, and uh, I love that, right? Um, I think that, like, there's an aspect of life that um, I, I am definitely drawn to, and I think that, you know, I like to encourage it in other people to do things that are challenging and terrifying, right? Because if you do, then... And I think that, that that line speaks to that aspect for me, for sure. That, like, well, if you're not... If you're playing things safe, if you're, like, careful, like, you're not going to really see a lot of change. You're not going to really... Um, you're not going to learn as much, right? Um, and uh, so... You know, and it's been awesome, of course, being here. You know, I don't like nothing terrifying has happened, of course. But like, you know, it's just like when I realize like I'm I'm pushing myself like just a little bit past my comfort zone. And I think this like applies to all kinds of things, you know, like just pressing pressing those boundaries, like, you know, I think that that like what else is life for, right? And I mean, and this is definitely part of like like I mentioned in the essay, part of my epistemology, part of like why I do things that I do, and I'm very well aware of this. I've known this for quite a long time. Um, so, uh, yeah, beyond that, I don't know if I've had any, any um, anything more to say about that line, except that, like, I think everybody should just do things that scare them, mm. right? Are you a skydiver? No, <laughs> although I will say there was one time many years ago where um, I was in uh, I was uh, chasing my housemate's dog down her driveway. It was a very sloped driveway, and it was all concrete. And so I'm chasing this. It was a boxer for crying out loud, and it was like barreling towards the street. And I'm like, I don't know why. Physics is not my strong point. I'm just gonna say. <laughs> And uh, so I'm running down a very steep concrete hill after a dog that I'm never going to catch, right? Um, and my feet started to turn out, like I just lost my footing. And I remember like, oh, 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 I'm going to fall. And then like I almost got my footing back. And I was like, oh, OK, great, I'm great. Uh, and this is like probably all of five seconds that this happened. And like, I gave my footing, and I'm like, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to catch the dog. And then of course, then my feet gave out from under me. And I just took this tumble, um, and it ended in like me just like it was a disaster. It was very, uh, very painful. <laughs> uh, no bro bones were broken, but um, as I like skidded to a stop, mm -hmm. I popped up from that, and I was just so full of adrenaline that I'm just like, that was amazing. <laughs> I'm going skydiving now. I'm going to go skydiving now, uh, which I haven't because. <laughs> There's other things that terrify me that I definitely do that don't that maybe cost as much, you know, right. and that sort of thing. However, I, that was that was something that came immediately to my mind in that in that weird moment. Let's go skydiving. <laughs> other questions? I have another one. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you were talking about the smoke drawings and making 
film on film. Mm -hmm. That sparked something in my mind, <laughs> but just thinking about the danger of working in film and how often there are stories of film going up in smoke. Oh yeah. And the smoke drawings are actually the only drawings in the exhibition that are accurately dated, we think, mm -hmm. that, um, and the earliest dating. So I was just thinking about that connection between smoke and film, and since you work in video and mm -hmm. film, I'm just wondering if you could talk about that more, or if that's this is interesting, interesting to you. To this or? is interesting to me. I, um, I, uh, I have a film that I just finished in Signal Culture, a narrative film uh, that is, I'm putting out into the festival market. But I also, just this week, released an earlier narrative short um, and uh, so you can find that on my Vimeo page. But I realized, in like simultaneously working on these two short, they're comedy films, they're like narrative comedies, they're like, you know, whatever. Um, but both, both of them feature fire as a significant element, right? In the, the comedy that I released this week, it's uh, two people sitting around a fire and talking, right? And then the other one, there's two people uh, who are in hell and they're sitting and they're talking and there's fire behind them. And so uh, I have this really strange habit of like not being aware of what I'm doing <laughs> until like it's like present in front of me, and I'm like, oh, apparently uh, this is what I do: is I make movies that have fire as a primary character, but maybe an unnamed character. This one had a fireplace mantle. In it, you yes, it did have a fireplace mantle, and it did have a fire uh, backdrop, or you know, had an overlay of uh, of actual flame footage as well. And so yes, this definitely was a was a part of it. So, um, you know, and I think uh, the literary side of me is very um, interested in the where there's smoke, there's fire aspect of what, um, what uh, connected here tonight. But I would say probably, you know, in kind of like looking at like my own like uh, spiritual practice, just kind of thinking about the ways that fire functions in terms of, uh, you know, a motivator for me. And so, uh, uh, you know, actually I'm not a quite aware of, of Paulina's like sun sign or anything like that, so like I wouldn't be surprised if she might have been a fire sign, for example. Um, but uh, you're like whatever, regardless. Um, uh, yeah, I think that there's probably more to be explored there. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, you know, I, I, when I mentioned that I have destroyed a lot of my own work, I've definitely destroyed a lot of it by fire because it's so efficient in a lot of ways. Just take a box of things down to the park and put it in the barbecue thing and, you know, burn it up. So, um, yeah, fire definitely figures in, for sure, for sure. It's so pretty. <laughs> it's really pretty, isn't it? Also, um, fire and film, like film, film, not video, <clears throat> are chemical processes. Yes. Okay. Right. Not electronic, not digital. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. that is true, that is true. And like, it is kind of funny, like working in video uh, primarily, I mean, I talk about some of the things that I do as film 